Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. This is Bishop A. Reginald Lippman, your host and senior pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. It's, it's always a great joy to have you with us, and certainly this week is no exception to that. Please do me a favor, like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and don't forget that down in the description box below is your own free copy of a handout of this teaching. It will help you to take a deeper dive into this lesson. And we've begun on last week a great little series called Lessons from the Twelve Disciples. That's right, we're actually walking through the stories and the lifestyles and those kinds of things and looking at the contributions that the 12 disciples each made. Last week, we began with Peter. This week, we go to part two, and we're going to talk about Andrew, a disciple's journey of faith. So again, welcome to the series and do let someone know that this is available. I do want to encourage you to grab that free PDF handout and you can share it with friends or loved ones around the corner or around the country. Well, let's jump in. So Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the first disciples of Jesus. And although he is often in the background, we rarely really see him up front. Andrew's life carries some very valuable lessons for us as modern day followers of Jesus Christ. So in this lesson, we're going to explore the life of Andrew, highlighting key points and insights that we can glean from his journey of faith. And we're also going to be referencing passages of scripture that show Andrew in action. So let's begin. So to begin with, as we think in terms of the life of Andrew, I want you to put yourself in a position of learning. What can I learn from these highlights that we're about to share regarding Andrew's life? Well, let's talk about some of the key points that make Andrew stand out above the other disciples. And these are also key points that you and I should and can very well apply to our own lives. All right, so here's the first key point for the week. Andrew exemplified immediate obedience to Christ's call. Immediate obedience to the call of Jesus Christ. Let's look at what the scripture says concerning Andrew in John chapter number one, verse 35 through verse number 42. There we find these words. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John, what John had said, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. So when we look at this, we find this amazing story of how Andrew's journey begins with his immediate response to Jesus's call. 
And Andrew recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And then he proceeds to introduce his brother, Simon Peter, to him. And from this, we learn the importance of promptly following God's call and sharing the good news with others. My question for you to ponder at this point is, how well are you doing with promptly responding to the call of Christ and with sharing the good news with others? If you were to grade yourself on this year as this year swiftly leaves us, as we prepare to go into a new year, how would you grade yourself in terms of immediate response to the Lord, secondly, sharing the good news with others? That's what we learned from the life of Andrew. Well, let's move to the second key point in his life. Number two, and we've already kind of highlighted this, bringing people to Christ. Let's go back to the passage, but let's zero in this time on John 1, verse 40, 41, and 42. And let's take another look at it to see how this disciple, has a very key point about his life, and that was bringing people to Christ. Again, John 1.40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John, who heard what John had said, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated, when, which when translated is Peter. So you can see very clearly from this particular passage of scripture, his emphasis on bringing others to Christ. And let me just stop here for a second. And I wanna point out something very important. It really, is jumping out at me from this passage. Before he went to minister to the world or even to share the good news with the world of who he had found, the first person he looks for is his brother. Do you think that he wanted to keep Jesus all to themselves? I don't think so. I think he knew the condition of his brother's heart and that his brother needed a change. So as you think on that, I want you to think about the condition of your family members' hearts. Do you have a brother, sister, relative, spouse perhaps, who you know needs a change? Notice the urgency in Andrew's efforts to go and share Jesus with his family. So often we carry big titles in church and maybe perform big roles in front of people. But a lot of times, the people up front are leaving souls at home, rushing to get to church. Our first ministry is our family. And that's one of the things that I have stood by and will stand by for the duration of my days. So my first ministry is in my house. Everything and everybody else comes secondary to that. And so we see the necessity, the passion that Andrew has of bringing people to Christ. Again, in case you just tuned in, we're talking about Andrew in the second part of our series on lessons from the disciples of Jesus. And Andrew had an immediate obedience to the, to the call of Christ. But we also saw that Andrew emphasized the need to bring people to Christ. Well, let's move on and see what else it is that we can learn from Andrew. Because again, his first, first act as a disciple was to bring his brother Peter to Jesus. Now, let me pause here one more second. I promise I'm going to move on. What if Andrew had never shared the gospel and the love and acceptance and peace that Jesus offers with Peter? As big of a character as Peter is in church history, there's a possibility 
that Peter would have missed out on the life that he experienced in the church and in Christ and the enormous role he plays in the New Testament. But how could the church have been different? How could our even our biblical stories be far different if Peter had not been introduced to Jesus by Andrew, his brother? So you never know how God is going to use a person, what God has for a person. And even if that person is you know, just wild and cantankerous and difficult to deal with. You never know how the Lord might use them. So share Christ with your family. And Andrew's first act as a disciple was to bring his brother Peter to Jesus. And this teaches us the significance of introducing others to the transformative power of faith. We should be eager to share our own experiences and tell our family Hey, you got to meet this man that has changed my life. We should be eager to share those experiences with others and to invite others into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's go to number three for this week as we talk about some of the key points in the life of Andrew. So number three is the role of humility. Now, we'll find this displayed by Andrew in John chapter 6, verse number 5 through verse number 9. It reads like this. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And I'll read this for you in case you can't see it. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So in this story, It's the feeding of the multitude with two fish and five loaves of bread, which was a miracle performed by Jesus. And in this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 plus, Andrew demonstrated humility by bringing a boy with five barley loaves and two fish to Jesus. Now, it was humility on a lot of levels. It was humility because surely what he verbalized was what people were internalizing. Look at that fool. Jesus has to feed all these people and the best he could come up with was two fish and five loaves of bread. Yet it was humility because in the innocence of his faith, he was simply trying to humbly obey the master, find something to work with. And so this act of service illustrates the value of humility in offering our resources to God, no matter how limited they may seem. Because if you recall, even he said, how far can this go? But yet he was willing to at least point out Jesus' idea, find something to work with. So as we offer to the Lord our best or our gifts or even our discoveries, We must do it with humility. We must do it with childlike faith that says, here's something to work with, although I do not see how it's going to work. See, humility is not always about seeing and knowing. It's about trusting in spite of not seeing and not knowing. And that's a great and valuable lesson that we learn concerning his humility and the role of humility in serving others as well as serving the Lord. What if that boy had said, I've got fish, I've got bread, but what if uh, Andrew had shut him down and said, that's nothing. That's nothing for the Lord to work with. You know, kind of like how some people will shut you down when you're offering your best. Listen, humility says, if you're willing to trust the Lord with what you have, I'm willing to help you discover how his hands can change what you have from not enough into more than enough. 
So we learn from Andrew the role of humility, and that is so powerful of a lesson. Well, here's number four for this week. Here's principle number four. From Andrew, we also learn this, an evangelist with a relational approach. He shows himself as an evangelist with a relational or relatable approach. Let's look at John chapter 12, verse 20, 21, 22 to see this. It says, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Now, what's interesting here is that there is a variation in ethnicities. And typically, these two groups or categories of people may not have had that much to do with each other. And yet, when these Greeks approached the disciples of Christ, wanting to be in the presence of Christ, wanting an audience with him, they didn't turn them around at the door. Uh, they did not shut them down. They did not stop them and say, well, you're not on the books. No, in fact, Andrew and Philip show us here that an evangelist has to be relational. Now, how does that apply to you and I today? Well, very simply this. If we're going to win others in love, we have to be relatable. We can't be great big me and little old you like so many people are. We can't look down our nose at anyone. We can't point fingers at anyone. We can't turn anyone away, not from Jesus. And so Andrew here shows us him being an evangelist with a relational approach. He wants to get these people to Jesus. And so rather than shutting them down and acting as if he's, uh, you know, the unofficial security, instead, as Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So we must be relational in our walk and talk if we're going to win others to Christ and even exemplify the love of Christ. Because had he and the others been, you know, nasty, bitter towards them, think about the reputation that that would have presented or misrepresentation that would have presented for a loving Christ. How do you and I interact with people who need Jesus? Because we may be the only Bible somebody will ever read and the only church somebody will ever attend. So we have to be mindful that we are loving towards all people. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in his sight. So Andrew is also seen in that passage introducing Greek-speaking Gentiles to Jesus. And he's emphasizing in that passage a relational approach to evangelism. He serves as a bridge between different cultures and backgrounds. And we can learn to engage people where they are in spite of their differences in respectful and inclusive conversations, even in spite of their diverse backgrounds. And that's the place that the church must get to if the church is to survive post-pandemic and in these days and times of decline in every major faith tradition. We must learn to be engaging and we must learn to be relational and we must learn to lay culture and a whole lot of other things aside so that we can get people to Jesus and let Jesus do the changing, not us. All right. So here's our fifth principle that is our key uh, factor about Andrew this week. Number five, 
he shows us perseverance and consistency. Perseverance and consistency. So Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 13 and verse number 14 reads like this. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, what we see here is that Andrew, he continues in terms of his presence in the upper room. This is X1. And so they are waiting for the promise that would be released in X2, the coming of the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost. And his continued presence in the upper room with the other disciples demonstrates perseverance. They had seen Jesus ascend back to heaven on a cloud. And they are now waiting on the manifestation of his promise, which would be the Holy Spirit coming now. As it were, they were doing a swing shift. He was going back up. Holy Spirit's coming down. And he continued to be there in the upper room while others walked away. It demonstrates great perseverance. And in Acts chapter one, as we just saw, Andrew is listed as one of those who join together constantly in prayer. And this really does underscore the importance of persistence in our faith journey, as well as in our communal worship. So we need to be consistent in our faith, as well as in our faith community. Now, that's not a slam for those that don't attend church physically anymore. I understand. I can't say that I'd be there every Sunday if I wasn't kind of the main <laughs> person on stage. I get that. But in this day and time of technology, you can still be engaged and involved in your faith community. Right now, we're engaging via technology. You're in the comments. That lets me know that you're here, that you're hearing and you're receiving. Also, another way to engage is to download that free PDF get it it's prepared just for you now it has notes in it from this session and you can also find some very engaging personal discovery questions that will help you take a deeper dive into today's teaching as we've learned about andrew i certainly hope you got a lot out of this i got a lot in preparing it and sharing it with you and Make sure that you do like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification so you'll be notified every time new content is loaded. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, you go with God.